Well, good afternoon and uh, good evening uh, uh, here from here in San Diego and across the country. My name is David Victor. I'm a professor here at the School of Global Policy and Strategy, GPS, here at UC San Diego. It's really my pleasure to welcome on behalf of GPS folks to this webinar this afternoon about sanctions on Russia and in particular the energy and food dimensions. Uh, I wanna introduce our moderator for today, Lisa Friedman. Uh, Lisa is a reporter in the Climate Desk at the New York Times, uh, covers a wide range of climate and environmental issues, extensive experience uh, before being at the New York Times, was at a number of other news sources, uh, including Climate Wire, and uh, also at the Oakland Tribune where she led the Washington Bureau. And so Lisa, I wanna give the floor to you. And thank you very much for hosting our session today. Thank you so much, David, and I'm so glad to be to be doing this today. Um, as David said, my name is Lisa Friedman. I'm a climate reporter at the New York Times, part of a, a large and growing team of reporters covering the climate crisis. Um, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has caused untold human suffering, and it also has reverberated far beyond the immediate conflict, especially in the areas of food and energy. Uh, we're going to talk about the breadth of these issues in the next uh, in the next 75 minutes. And to do that, I am honored to be speaking with a, a truly thoughtful panel of experts. Um, before I introduce them, I'm going to give all of you a brief sort of run of show. Um, where the panel are, is going to have a moderated conversation with me for about 45 minutes, and then we'll leave about a half hour for your questions. You are welcome to put questions in the, the Q&A for me, or if you prefer to ask a question yourself, use the raise hand function, and we will call on you to unmute yourself. Um, you have many of the, the you have the bios uh, already, so I'll just do some brief introductions here, uh, starting with uh, Jennifer Burney. She is the Associate Professor Marshall Saunders Chancellor's Endowed Chair in Global Climate Policy and Research. Uh, Professor Bernie is an environmental scientist whose research focuses on the coupled relationships between food and climate security. Stephen Haggard is the Lawrence and Sally Krauss Professor of Korea Pacific Studies, the director of the Korea Pacific Program. He has done extensive research on North Korea and in, partic in particular and uh, sanctions regimes. Vijay, Vijay, I'm mortified. I'm sorry. I'm uh, Vijay Vaithaswaran is the global energy and climate innovation editor with the Economist, uh, covering the energy and utilities industries, the clean energy transition, climate innovations, and low carbon technologies. And finally, I'm reintroducing David Victor, who started us off. Uh, he is the professor of innovation and public policy at the School of Global Policy and Strategy. He is also the co-director of the campus-wide deep decarbonization initiative uh, and someone I call on often for smart thoughts about what is happening in global climate policy. Um, and David, since, since all of this was your idea, let's start with you. <laughs> um, you know, the past, Last week, uh, you know, President, uh, President Biden announced the biggest and the longest release from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve in history. Tell us a little bit about what the invasion of Ukraine has done to the energy markets and whether this release is, is a good idea. Is this a good use of resources? Yeah, well, thank you very much, Lisa. Um, it's obviously hard to speculate you know, in detail right now in the middle of so many things changing so quickly, but I guess I'd say three things about where we are with energy prices and oil prices in particular. First is that over the last 52 weeks, we've seen oil trading uh, at wildly different levels from about $60 a barrel to now kind of low hundreds. It got as high as about $130, $135 a barrel. So that's not quite as high as it was in 1979 into current dollars when oil went up at least briefly up to about $160 a barrel in, in current levels, but it's a big increase. That increase began last year with the roaring back of the global economy. So prices were already on the rise. There were all these supply chain issues that are very familiar to folks and so on. And so energy was getting more expensive. 
And then along came the, the invasion of Ukraine. And what it's not so much that the invasion of Ukraine has resulted in Putin, for example, using the oil weapon or the energy weapon. He's weaponized weapons is what he's done. But the invasion of Ukraine has put a lot of sanctions, resulted in sanctions, the topic that we have tonight. And the sanctions themselves have taken some oil off the market, and they've also made doing business with Russia very, very difficult. So it's just created a huge amount of chaos inside the markets, also a lot of uh, a lot of speculation. So that brings us to what Biden, the Biden administration did last week in announcing this six month release of oil. Uh, and we'll see how much oil actually gets released. This is a kind of pledge to on what to do, and then it'll be updated on a fairly regular basis. One of the main effects of that has been is to calm the markets a little bit. There was quite a lot of evidence that, that the oil prices, at least in the short term, were also being driven by speculation, by concerns about whether parties were going to be able to actually create the financial cover needed to take some of the bets. So it's not quite as bad as a nickel market, which actually seized up for a while. But people were starting to get worried about that. So one of the main effects of this and why I'm broadly supportive of it has been to send that signal to the, to the markets. And the third and last thing I'll say about this is that while I'm broadly supportive of it, and I think most people think that this was a good idea, you know, I'm concerned about a couple aspects of it. One is the president is talking about this as a mechanism to lower the price of gasoline, whereas what the Strategic Petroleum Reserve is designed for is is strategic uh, action. And that's the real reason. And that has not been very well explained to the public. The other concern I have is that this was done more or less unilaterally. We've seen over the last few days that other European countries have come along to kind of pretend that this was a collective action effort. But this is unlike the releases that were announced in the beginning of March, where actually all the Western countries came together and they said, we're doing this together, a significant release. This current release is much bigger. And I think that this is a bit of a concern because the sanctioning regime is only as good as the sanctioners hang together. And, and I think right now you're starting to see individual national interest coming a little more to the fore, and that's not good news for the long haul. So, so even though, if I could just follow up, uh, you know, even though this was done, was, was, is discussed in the context of lowering the price of gas rather than a strategic move as it's supposed to be. It's still, you think, a, a I, smart use of resources at this yeah, point? Yeah, I think it's a smart use of resources because you're sending a very clear signal to the market. Now, normally we'd expect also the major oil suppliers to also send that signal to the market that these prices are unstable. And frankly, you know, it's like kids playing with matches uh, in terms of financial risks to the financial system of a lot of this speculation getting out of control and seizing up some of the some of the financial markets. I think the really striking thing in all this is the extent to which OPEC has just been unhelpful. Um, and it's, you know, not their job to help us out, but it is their job to help create stability inside the markets. And the Saudis and the Emiratis, led by the Saudis, the Saudis have, for a variety of political reasons that I'm sure we'll get into, the Saudis have really taken the wrong strategy here. And I think it is, what do they say diplomatically, unfortunate. We'll come back to OPEC. Stephen, uh, Russia has become the most sanctioned country. Um, we could see even more sanctions in, in the wake of these shocking photographs of war crimes in Bucha, um, and we can come back to that. But the sanctions against Russia already dwarf those against Iran and North Korea. Um, if, if, the, if they are done in hopes of pressuring Putin to abandon the war, uh, are, are they working? Do sanctions, are these sanctions working? What, what effect are they having? Well, you know, of course, it depends on what you mean by work, and that's uh, that sounds like an advocate response, but it's not. I think we know from studies of sanctions that if you're talking about achieving a strategic objective that's very important to an adversary, sanctions just don't work. And in about 15 to 20 percent of sanctions cases, only do you get you know the capacity to really change a, an adversary's strategic objectives. And Iran is often cited as a good example of that. But that may be a too narrow lens to think about sanctions because we also have the objective of degrading the capability of an adversary, for example. So Putin may not cease and desist in Ukraine, but we wanna make sure that he doesn't have access to technologies that make it easier for him to export weapons or to continue to pursue the conflict. And we may just wanna punish them and send a signal that this is costly. So I don't expect that the sanctions are going to have the effect of stopping the war in Ukraine anytime soon, but they may serve these other purposes. Other purposes, including degrade, uh, 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 isolating Russia and... 
Well, and, and just simply uh, assuring that they don't have access to technologies which can be used to pursue the war. Uh, this comes up in the context of the energy markets, and I think David can speak to this, because some of the export controls are targeted precisely at gas and oil extraction technologies. So in other words, making it difficult for Putin not only to sell oil now, but to continue to extract oil and resources from it going into the future. Let's, let's bring food into the, this conversation. Jen, Russia's invasion of Ukraine is threatening to cause a global food crisis. Um, explain this intersection and what, what you see on the horizon. Sure, thanks. Yeah, the, the invasion um, is tied into the world food, to, food situation in a number of different ways, both direct and indirect that are gonna unfold also over different timescales. So the first um, and most immediate is just a direct disruption. So, um, you know, combined Russia and Ukraine um, sub provide about 30% of exports of barley and wheat, so it's the main staple food crops, and about 50% uh, of um, vegetable oil exports come from Ukraine. So just really food basics, a lot of countries depend on food coming out of this region. And right now, um, you know, the Black Sea port infrastructure is just um, out of commission. And so um, this, this um, pipeline for food is, is just shut off in the, in the short term for some countries that are really starting to feel the hurt immediately. So Egypt and Lebanon, I think, are the first ones that, um, you know, that are sort of the canaries in the coal mine, if you will, um, directly dependent and prices are rising and um, you know, aid is being requested um, both directly by the countries and through World Food Program. Um, this, the second thing is, is that this is then gonna ripple through the global, the world food economy just through trade, right? So lots of countries import a little bit of one thing, export a little bit of another thing. Um, and, uh, you know, there are sort of threatened trade disruptions. So countries who get skittish about having enough domestic supply may cut off exports prematurely. And, and, and these, these ripple effects, uh, both through um, trade barriers and through high prices, of course, affect uh, poor people most, uh, most early and, and most severely. Uh, the, the second way that this is connected is through oil prices, right? So rising, rising oil prices are gonna impact um, the cost of fertilizer, the ability to, to make and get fertilizer around the world, um, as well as sort of on-farm energy use costs. And so that's gonna play out um, you know, over a little bit longer time scales, but in general, farmers are, are going to be budget constrained uh, and be able to sort of afford less of this. And that's going to feed back into lower productivity, most likely um, in a lot of places. Uh, these energy prices are also going to put pressure on food crops to be diverted for biofuels. Um, that, that is also going to play out if energy prices stay high. And, and finally, the sanctions, um, sort of the longer they stay in place, um, the more it's really going to matter for um, ordinary people inside Russia who are really being squeezed economically and, and also, of course, Russian farmers who won't be able to access, um, you know, inputs in the same way for production. So th that'll play out a little bit longer, but these are really deeply intertwined issues. Oh, there's, there's a lot to, to unpack there. Um, and we'll come back to it, but AJ, can you, I, you know, I was hoping you could, could weave some of this together for us, we're now talking about energy security in a way that, that you know, we didn't since the, since the 70s. Um, how are you thinking about this rush for energy security in the context of, of, this, of our, the broader energy transition that, that needs to happen? Does, 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 do these immediate needs put a cleaner energy transition on hold? So uh, I think that's um, one of the meta questions at this point. Um, yeah. uh, and you're, sir, you're right to highlight that tension there. Um, uh, what, there's something that uh, policy wonks call the energy trilemma, right? The, uh, the desire to pursue energy security, uh, energy affordability, we can call it. And the third, of course, is environmental issues like climate. Uh, in the case of Europe, most notably, 
they had doubled down on the climate imperative. They're leading the world in many ways on climate change policies. Um, they'd kind of forgotten about the economics of it beyond just liberalizing markets and spot markets for gas they thought would solve the problem of competition. We saw late last year that really came and bit them in the rear end when we saw a gas supply shock and power supply shock. So there was actually two crises that here hit your energy markets. The first one was, was not geopolitically related um, and that reasserted economics, uh, that leg of the trilemma. And of course, as Russia has done with a vengeance, brought security of supply back into the fold as really the dominant issue right now, which Europe, it must be noted, had been extremely complacent to the point of negligence. Germany, for example, had had multiple warning shots with um, Putin rattling the saber on gas in 2009, 2014, uh, interrupting supplies uh, to some degree. And yet Germany's reliance on imports of natural gas from Russia increased over that period of time. It didn't decrease, they didn't diversify. They built no liquefied natural gas uh, terminals, LNG terminals to receive gas from other countries uh, by ship, for example, unlike other parts of Europe. And so you saw a great, uh, I would argue, a complacency. And we can get into the, the heart and soul of Germany. Why was this the case? Um, uh, long term, you know, the Soviets didn't cut off gas to, to Germany even during the, the Cold War. You can say there's a reasonable school of thought that, that they could have relied on them. But I think there's some dimension to this where there was a certain sense that uh, they know better than those uh, uh, sort of puritanical yanks who worry about the Russians or the Poles or always worried about it. Russia will never cut off its best customer. They felt they had a special relationship and somehow they would be immune on the energy security question. And that's been shown to be uh, incorrect, that, that the Poles were right, uh, that Russia is unreliable and indeed more than that is threatening. And so I think that rebalancing now threatens to send the climate transition, at least to put it on hold for a few years, because we're going to have to see more investment in uh, fossil fuels. We're seeing some of that with the deal the Biden administration has arranged with Europe and, and others. We can dig, dig into more on that. Um, and we can ask the question, is this temporary? Can we still double down on climate and achieve climate ambitions with a temporary boost to fossil fuels? Or is there a risk that this derails the climate transition for a decade leads to fossil fuel lock-in of infrastructure. If it's done the wrong way, the latter is possible. So I think this requires threading a very, very small needle. We're gonna, we're gonna go more deeply into this, but what does the wrong way look like? Uh, just to give a simple example, okay, um, yeah. if lots of uh, oil and gas projects uh, get the green light, I mean, part of the reason we've seen um, uh, uh, lower levels of investment in global oil and gas projects is investors have concluded, for example, that oil and gas, particularly oil, uh, doesn't have a bright future. Uh, and that even natural gas in Europe, because of policy, Europe made it very unfriendly uh, for, for natural gas investors. It was not seen as a, an attractive fuel. Um, you couldn't get uh, a European utility to sign long-term contracts with American LNG shippers. The LNG shippers tell me it was very hard to find a European utility customer, um, in part because they were discouraged from signing long-term contracts. But secondly, they didn't know if gas is gonna be banned in 10 years or priced out of the market or uh, regulated out. And so who would sign a 20-year contract for, for gas from the US or Qatar or anywhere else? Uh, not very many, right, is the answer. And so there was a discouragement of what is uh, a transition fuel. And now Europe has recognized this even before the uh, Russian invasion. They said, hold on a minute, we are now going to consider natural gas as a sort of a transition fuel. When you have these sorts of mixed signals, uh, if now we have lots of fossil fuel infrastructure that's invested in without thought to how to sunset it, for example, uh, because normally these in investments require 20, 30 years uh, of payback, or at least they have life cycles. Investors will want their money back. And that's how capital markets work. And you say, well, after five years, you can stop producing oil and gas guys. We're good with the windmills. That ain't going to work so much. You, either you're not going to get the investment or you're not going to, it's still going to be cranked out. And so that's why um, there's talk of future proofing some of these investments, maybe making the uh, natural gas investments hydrogen ready, Again, we could talk about uh, what, what that means and if that's realistic, but who pays? Would it be the taxpayer? Probably. Uh, it's not going to be private sector investors who aren't going to pay extra to sugarcoat uh, um, fossil fuel infrastructure with future proofing unless you require it. So I think not enough thought has gone into that. I think there's a very real 
prospect that the momentum behind, if it's hundreds of billions of new dollars worth of new investment in fossil fuel infrastructure, that that will continue to produce fossil fuels. It may not go to Europe, but it'll go somewhere else in the world, right? Because oil is fungible, it, it trades freely. Huh. Okay, let me, let me, let's pull back a moment. Um, Stephen, I'd like to, to dig into to your work studying sanctions and uh, sanction regime in North Korea. What, tell us a little bit about your work and what we can learn from the sanction regime, regime in North Korea. Um, you know, we, we touched on this a moment ago, but if, if sanctions haven't brought down these regimes, uh, why, you know, what, what's the most that, that they can do now? No, no, that's a very good question. I mean, you know, if you look at some of the most heavily sanctioned countries in the world, they haven't managed to displace leaders. I mean, Maduro's in power in Venezuela. Last time I checked, Kim Jong-un has been under sanctions for two decades since the nuclear test of 2006. The Iranian mullahs are in power and so on. You know, so, so I think one thing we certainly have to, take into account is that the type of regimes that we're going to want to sanction are those in which the underlying mechanism of the sanction is actually not likely to work exactly. Because remember, remember, you know, the basic idea of a sanction is that you impose a cost on the entire population, actually, not just on the elites. And you anticipate that that cost is going to be a political albatross along, uh, around the neck of the leadership, which then moderates its behavior in order to get the sanctions lifted. Because we have to remember that the logic of sanctions isn't just to impose them, it's to impose them and lift them in return for some quid pro quo, like getting out of Ukraine. But the problem for a Putin is that he can absorb the costs because his oligarchs, despite the fact that they're probably among the most heavily sanctioned, have got ample places to stash their assets out of the reach of banking regulators. And he can simply turn to repression, which is exactly what he's done. So I think we just we have to- seize all the yachts we want, but- <laughs> What's that say? I'm sorry? I said, so we can seize all the yachts we want, but, but and, you know, and, and penthouses in New York, but- Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, look, some of these sanctions against oligarchs, I think, are really playing for the political grandstand as much as anything else, because as, as soon as you announce a sanction against any individual oligarch, all of the rest of the oligarchs are going to get a, get on the, online to their wealth managers and basically say, look, put this deeper into my Cayman Islands you know, shell company. So, so what, where, where, what sanctions are likely to be most important then? Well, I think the most, uh, the most significant sanction, and we can talk about how this relates to the energy market, is a financial sanction that I think came as a complete surprise to Putin. And so let me just give a little bit of a backstory on it. Um, you know, since 2014, and even before, the Russian central bank and the conduct of Russian fiscal policy has actually been surprisingly conservative compared to that in other oil states. I mean, look at a Venezuela, for example, which has just collapsed into kind of populist, you know, uh, decline. Uh, but monetary policy was very tight uh, and cautious in Russia over the last 10 years. Fiscal policy was very modest. External debt is modest. The country ran current account surpluses and they accumulated about $650 million in external reserves, which is not huge. Uh, China's sitting on three plus trillion, but it's not trivial either. That's a fair amount of money. Yeah. And what happened was that, and this wasn't just the United States, this is a concerted action. The Western central banks basically have attached those reserves and said that the Russian central bank does not have access to foreign exchange reserves that are being held in other central banks. The Fed is sitting about on about eight and a half percent of those. Um, you know, Britain and France have surprisingly larger shares. And so Putin is out of pocket for about 350 million, 350 billion dollars, excuse me which has been attached. And I think that's what drove the initial movements in the foreign exchange markets and in the Russian stock market before countermeasures were taken. 
So that was the source of the initial shock. Yeah. That's, that's really helpful. Um, Jen, you know, as you noted, we are, we are now in the middle of a, of a massive food shock. Prices were rising before the war and now they've skyrocketed um, in part because of the disruptions in shipping that you, you mentioned and, and elsewhere. Are there historical experiences that, that you think about in the context of what you're seeing now? What are there analogs to, to, to where we are now with a, with a looming food crisis? That's a great question. I think there are partial analogs. So I guess now um, in real terms, we are at kind of 1970, you know, 70s oil crisis, um, food prices, mm -hmm. uh, which is sort of shocking because the decline in food prices, you know, after that uh, were really important contributors to alleviation of global poverty. Um, and so rising food prices, you know, just backslide us, um, you know, years of development uh, by pushing people you know, people who spend a lot of their income on food further into poverty, um, as opposed to being able to lift themselves out. Um, so, so I think, you know, in terms of prices, that's the world we're in right now. Um, in terms of a sort of systemic shock, I think, you know, we saw a big food price spike in 2007, 2008, after this kind of long period of decline in prices. Um, that was caused by a confluence of events that's not entirely dissimilar from what we see right now. Um, sort of uh, uh, climate and environment piece, you know, a shock to wheat production, um, uh, speculation driving up prices, um, pressure to use food crops um, for biofuels, um, also because of high energy prices at the same time, and, uh, and uh, you know, skittish um, policy making, right, putting in export bans um, out of fear for domestic supplies around the world. So, that's that's kind of a similar architecture uh, to what we're seeing right now. And PJ, let's. I'd like to dig into Europe's pledge to reduce consumption of Russian gas. They are they have a, a claim that they will will reduce consumption by sixty six percent before the end of this year, uh, and that they'll break the bloc's dependence on Russian energy by twenty twenty seven. How realistic is that? So um, the idea that they uh, they can diversify away from Russian gas uh, is very attractive, but that's not what experience, recent history shows, right? In mm. fact, the, in the German case, it increased its its reliance. Uh, basically, the, the uh, but if it were to be a crash course, and that's what we've been promised, right? That we see the the, the writing on the wall has been read by. Germany, most notably, but also we have a new energy policy from Brussels that was unveiled the same week as the U.S. oil sanctions on Russia. Um, how do you get off of Russian gas really fast? Well, in the short term, you get gas from somewhere else. That's one way, diversification, in other words. Um, so they're going to increase what little extra production they can get from Norway and, and Holland, even though there are earthquakes associated with Dutch gas production, they're going to try to squeeze a little bit more gas from that source. There's not much more to be had from North Africa in the short term, piped gas. They're going to uh, increase their coal production. There's some plants that produce coal energy that are not that have been running below uh, uh, peak levels. They're going to crank up, unfortunately, from the point of view of climate, coal-based electricity to get off a bit of uh, gas. And they're going to, of course, go in a mad rush to try to get liquefied natural gas. That is gas that's frozen, sent on a ship around the world, uh, and behaves a little bit more like oil does in that it's, it's a, a little bit more freely traded. The problem, and that's what the, the, the so-called Marshall Plan announced by the Biden administration to help Europe is all about. The, the dirty little secret is that U.S. has tons of gas. We have you know, huge amounts of gas in, uh, in uh, shale territory, but we have virtually no export capacity that's spare. We're running at almost 100% on our LNG export uh, capacity, uh, and it, it takes a while to crank it up. It takes you know, uh, longer than we have by the end of this year to send additional cargoes. And there are investments being made and more will need to be made to uh, uh, liquefy and then get the ships needed to send them to Europe. That's one part of the infrastructure bottleneck. That's gonna take a, a year or two. Uh, and on the European side, what you have to receive them and uh, regasify these things at terminals. On paper, it looks like Europe has plenty of infrastructure for that. They actually are, uh, have surplus regas capacity. But when you actually look and see where is this capacity, a lot of it is in Spain 
which is pretty useless to Europe because the interconnectors are very meager. So that, that capacity doesn't help in getting that to where it's needed. And France and Britain, which are basically on the Western side of Europe. And if Russia were to cut off the gas, which is a prospect in the next four weeks, because there's a battle over the currency in which gas should be paid. Putin is insisting it should be in rubles. Europe says no, they may cut off the gas as a threat. Well, that gas cutoff is in Eastern part of Europe. Um, and people who know this on the ground tell me there aren't enough regas facilities close to where the gas is needed or the interconnectors or the so-called reverse flow capabilities to get the gas, even if you can magically produce huge amounts of LNG, which is also not easy to do. Most of it is contracted to Asia. And so even if you could get it, you may not get it where you need it. Uh, and Germany has refused to build LNG regas terminals for its own ideological reasons until very recently. So all of these things mean that this idea of gas coming to the rescue on a ship is not gonna happen this year, not in any meaningful way. So then you turn to the other side of the ledger and that is demand. And this is really what is gonna to have to be some version of either, uh, you can say it in a positive light, efficiency, uh, demand side reductions, you can say it in a more, uh, let's say threatening light, rationing, uh, demand destruction, uh, but something along that spectrum has to happen. If there were to be a genuine crash course to get off of Russian gas in the short term, I don't see a whole lot of other alternatives. Nuclear plants, for example, can't suddenly be brought online magically, although Germany could delay the shutting down of some that are due to be um, to go offline. But that wouldn't solve the problem by itself. I, I think it's a very difficult bind for Europe. Yeah, David, I mean, we, we are not really talking about conservation in any serious way we don't uh we don't nobody's putting a cardigan on telling us to, to lower our thermostats or or drive less or carpool um you know which which so so which we did see in the 70s is this just uh a, a third rail now do we not want to ask people to to consume less um and what are some other you know places where the oil crisis in the 1970s, uh, you know, parallels and, and divergences? So I think it's a good question and it really connects a number of the dots that have been discussed here. First, I think the lesson from Jimmy Carter is don't wear a cardigan when you give a speech about this. So that lesson has been learned and the answer is no cardigans, you know, maybe Patagonia jacket or something like that. Um, I actually think we're doing a lot on that front, but it's less visible. Partly we're doing a lot just from price induced effects. I mean, Vijay mentioned in passing, the, the, the uh, price of natural gas in Europe has gone up by a factor of five or more. You've seen price of electricity go up, which at the margin is more or less set by the price of natural gas, huge increase in electricity prices. That on its own is gonna induce a whole lot of conservation. You know, people won't call it conservation, but it's gonna be conservation. Plus you've got efficiency standards. The Europeans are a very aggressive set of efficiency standards. We've just announced a new round of efficiency standards initially in automobiles. Why don't people call it conservation? Why don't people want to talk about this? Anymore? Because really that politically from? Yeah, yeah, and and, uh, and and also the the what you do when it comes to conservation is like a dog's breakfast of activities, like a whole bunch of stuff as opposed to a single thing. You know, we want to have LNG regasification terminals and so on. So first, on the demand side, I think we're actually doing a lot. We'll do a lot more. Supply side, I, I agree with Vijay's assessment. I'm a little more optimistic. It's like not my comfort zone. Normally I'm the pessimist in the room, but I'm a little more optimistic that they're going to scramble and find more supplies. Certainly in the short term, they're going to burn more coal. That's going to be bad for climate. What I am seeing is because the energy business is so capital intensive and low carbon energy technologies are even more capital intensive, everyone is in the business is super attentive to the logic that VJ laid out, which is if you're going to do new projects, you have to be confident that the policy environment is going to be there. And I think that's one of the big differences between now and the 1970s. Is now um, you you see much greater confidence. I think starting in Europe that the policy environment around a low carbon future is there. That on the short term they're going to find as much stuff that burns and offset the, the short term interruptions. But for the longer term, if anything, they've doubled down on low carbon futures. And you see this in the investment plans around hydrogen. You know, hydrogen by itself is not going to solve the problem, but it's going to be part of the solution. Uh, the German behavior, the reversal in German behavior. The, 
Reginald behavior by Germany was was you know like a like a drug addict and their drug supplier. The gas is there from the Russians. We're fine with it. Done. Now the German government has turned on a dime. You see not only big investments around low carbon futures and 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 they're the, really the anchor of that in Western Europe, uh, but you also see just in the last few days evidence that the German the network authorities or the regulator for network industries is starting to look into Gazprom's behavior around manipulating storage and manipulating gas supplies. Um, a lot of us for a long time have been saying we ought to be doing more with antitrust, what we call in America antitrust law against the against the Russian, you know, hard to do under current European law. The Germans are taking the lead and trying to push that forward. So I, I'm cautiously optimistic that this time is going to be different compared to the 1970s, because what I'm seeing, again, Europe is really at the center of this. What I'm seeing is a much more credible policy environment. And in that policy environment, then you can start to see investment around, around new futures. And just last thing I'll say about this, which is one of the great tests of all this is going to be to watch the investment book for the Western, for the for the oil and gas companies, because there's a ton of cash has come in. Will they give the cash back to shareholders or will they invest in some more of the hydrogen projects and, and other kinds of projects that are consistent with a low carbon future? You're seeing even these kinds of risks in the LNG export business. The LNG export business in the United States is poised to do very well. And you're seeing some projects that are already planning expansion but everyone's nervous that you shouldn't overplay your hand and build too much for this big new European nat natural gas consumption future because they don't really have confidence that actually Europe is going to lock in the, 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 the gas system for the future. And that's a huge risk because the LNG business right now is, is very tight and you make a lot of money exporting, but it, it, periodically it's oversupplied and those are disastrous times for, for big capital intensive projects. Vijay, I'd love to throw this back over to you for a moment because, you know, I mean, we're, we're hearing, right, the Biden administration is, is, is saying we can do both, right? We can meet this moment by increasing supply and uh, an effort to, to, to address the, the energy crisis and lower gas prices. And we can also uh, prepare for the energy transition to tackle climate change. Do you think that we are investing enough in the clean energy transition to ensure that that is a reality? I would have answered that question before the Russia crisis by saying, no, we're not. And, and we're certainly not now. I um, mean, we've seen the, the centerpiece of, of, of the president's uh, climate proposal stalled in Congress, right? Uh, we'll see what happens in the coming weeks with Build Back Better. But, um, uh, and even if it were to pass on the way, that, you know, sort of the outlines, the ambitious versions of it, it would still not be enough to achieve the US's own commitments. Uh, and obligations uh, to the prim uh, Paris Climate Accords, most likely, um, in part because all that has been seen to be feasible to get through Congress uh, is uh, carrots. There are no sticks in the Build Back Better proposal. That is, it's a bunch of money for various aspects of the energy industry. Some of them clean, some of them dirty, uh, but it, it's it's a big grab bag of goodies uh, for various aspects of the energy, which is partly why it, it's popular. It's partly why it might actually pass. Uh, yeah, is the tax enough. incentives. Um, <laughs> but there is no meaningful carbon price. There is no uh, uh, stick on regulation. And what we need is we need carrots and sticks. We, we know how uh, change happens in, in these sorts of industries. And so it will help to have that. It's better than having nothing at all, uh, which is the alternative on offer at the moment. So, uh, And this was true, again, before the, the sort of the Russia crisis exposed this geopolitical dilemma. And uh, before the administration went out openly. And I was there at an oil conference in Houston a couple of weeks ago where Jennifer Granholm and uh, you were and others, uh, David was there as well, uh, where the administration both on one hand said, look, we really care about climate change. You must do better. And also, oh, by the way, please drill. You know, we need more energy uh, to solve this, uh, uh, you know, get us out of this problem. And uh, spending time with the oil guys at that conference, what they heard was, ah, we're relevant. At long last, we're getting a bit of love and maybe our investors will hear this and will be allowed to drill, right? Uh, a lot of the reasons these guys are, haven't been uh, drilling uh, is not so much the red tape, but because they've been under su such shackles from their investors that CEOs uh, have to return capital under you know, sometimes even pay contracts that they have. Uh, many of these um, shale drillers are forced to send uh, capital back to their investors rather than continue to grow at very high rates as in the past because the industry destroyed $300 billion worth of investor capital. It's a terrible industry when it comes to a return profile, so they're not trusted. And so if that deal is gonna change and the if government says, please drill more in the national interest, 
investors have to get the green light saying, okay, fine, go drill some more, let's make some short-term profits. There is the very real prospect uh, that David raised, of course, that you know, uh, as with LNG, you'll see a price bust. That typically is what happens in, in these cyclical industries. Massive amount of capital investment and very high prices now, almost certainly guarantees some kind of price adjustment or collapse later on. And that's exactly what investors don't want. So you see the tension there. Uh, in the meanwhile, if this does happen and you lock in that infrastructure for export, let's say, even at a loss or close to it, the fossil fuels will likely be exported at the margin. I, we should note that uh, oil executives are going to be in front of the House Energy and Commerce Committee this week. Um, you know, it's it's somewhat ironic that that uh, lawmakers who just a few months ago brought oil executives in front of Congress to tell them to produce less are going to be asking this week if they are indeed producing more, as the administration is now asking. Um, and I'm sure also there's going to be a, a robust conversation about windfall profits and um, and the like. David, is this a is this a, a smart idea right now for, for Democrats to? Uh... Well, I mean, it's part of the playbook. Right? It's actually, okay. I've been yeah. surprised that it took the Democrats as long as it did to remember what they do during an energy crisis, which is they blame the oil companies. So the Republicans said we need to drill more, conservation people say we need to have more conservation. Uh, and then the Democrats are supposed to say it's the oil company's fault. And it actually took them two or three weeks. So I, I don't know what amnesia set in in the Democratic Party, but they got on the playbook. And um, uh, and now they're 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 beating up on the oil companies for super normal profits and so on. Um, this part of this is just the normal theater, but I think the really serious part of this is exactly where VJ and, and you and others have been writing, which is you got to walk this this line because in the short term, if we don't, I, I care about carbon and I care about deep decarbonization, and so that's the long term goal here. But if in the short term you don't take reasonable actions to tamp down prices and to keep markets stabilized, then I think you really erode political support for long-term actions. And you've seen this, you know, the climate as a topic has really just fallen off the radar screen for most Americans. They're worried about other things. They're worried about inflation, worried about war, they're worried about health and so on. And climate's one of those topics that comes and goes. And so you, you need to put together and hold together a centrist coalition. And so I, I, I think it's, it's going to be an awkward set of hearings with the oil executives who are going to be talking about how they're doing um, the work for the country by producing more oil. Oil. I think the questions that will be most important to watch around decarbonization aren't about the immediate windfall profits and how much of the windfall is given back to rate to share, not rate pairs, to um, how quickly I forget the industry, to shareholders. Um, but it's what is your plan for the longer term capital budget? It's so interesting to see the, Amer the American oil companies were, were for, with a few exceptions, were really far behind the Europeans who early on understood, partly because we're on a lot, a lot of pressure at home, we've got to take the climate problem seriously. And so they haven't you know, shifted their entire capital budget, but larger fractions of capital budget, still less than the majority. Americans are much slower. And so I would like to see pointed questions about what the capital investment plan is around low carbon futures, because now almost all the majors have laid out at least a, a draft vision of what they might do with more capital around low carbon, are they gonna deliver? So speaking of pointed questions, I hope all of you in the audience have some for our panelists. I'd, I'd love for you to start raising your hands or putting questions in for me, um, which I'll get to in a moment. But I, I wanna ask you, Stephen, I, I mean, European officials have signaled that they could sanction Russia's energy exports um, after these images of, of mass killings of civilians emerged. What What is your sense about the likelihood of Europe sanctioning energy exports and what would that do to inflation, the energy markets, gas prices? Oh boy, I mean, this is a question you're probably better, better posed to David, but I mean, we all know that there's quite significant division within the EU on, on taking this step. And, you know, there have been some surprises like the Baltics and Poland, but you know the U.S. action comes when it isn't particularly dependent on Russian, you know, oil. Needless to say, um, so you know, I I I think with the dependence, I'm just looking at the levels of dependence. I don't see a blanket action against Russian gas and oil. 
I do, it does raise a somewhat different question, which is what are the strategies that the Russians have? And this gets into big questions like what's the relationship with China? How much pressure can China take off of the, the Western you know, pressure on Russia? And you know, this is just a classic sanctions question because sanctions are most likely to work when you have a unified front. But if you've got a parallel universe into which Russia can retreat, even in part, it could probably stumble along with lower growth in a much tighter relationship with China. And I think that's, the, that's a question that David might want to address. I mean, maybe I'll just talk briefly about that because um, I, I understand the pressure on the Europeans and it's just horrific what's happening as a result of, of the Russian invasion. But when you're sanctioning, you have to hold the sanctioners together as an alliance to the extent feasible, and you have to develop sanctions that don't impose such high costs on yourself that you can't hold the sanction and alliance together. So I don't think until they do more of the things that Vijay was talking about, I don't think they're in the position to fully sanction Russian gas exports or Russian oil exports. A whole lot of oil is flowing uh, from Russia into the European market. Um, some of it can go to other markets. China uh, will pick up and has been already picking up some of it. Some of the transactions appear to be clearing through through the Chinese financial institutions. In my mind, the, the even more interesting case is India. India's got possibly the hardest foreign policy to prosecute today because they've got a relationship with Russia, including a supplier of nuclear reactors and all kinds of other materials. They're getting discounted oil from the Russians. And yet they have a very important set of relationships with us they have to be cognizant of. And so um, you'll see some oil leak out of this system. There won't be a perfect sanctioning uh, 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 mechanism, but I don't think the Europeans are ready yet. And frankly, the West has done a pretty good job in this area. One of the areas where I think we made a mistake was er the, the, the symbolic thing the United States did, which was to ban Russian oil, I think really was unhelpful because it was largely irrelevant. And it, it uh, kind of showed, hey, they're banning uh, Russian oil. Why don't we ban Russian oil as well? And the politics of this are so hard. That was just an unnecessary action on our part that has made life harder for the Europeans. I agree with that. And I just want to ask you, Jen, I mean, we have, we've talked so much about, you know, energy development and, and, the, and climate change. Tell us, you know, we talked earlier about how climate ch change affects food production and food production affects the climate. Um, tell me how climate change is figuring into food supply issues right now. Yeah, so, uh, you know, it's um, again, sort of playing out at two different time scales, uh, but it, it'd be hard to overstate how much it is sort of a giant thumb pressing on the system here. So, um, you know, the first is just over the past few decades, a number of countries in the world um, have moved really outside of production optimal conditions due to due to longer run changes, right? And so, this set of countries has become you know ever more uh, dependent on imports. So, just increased kind of trade reliance, and these are countries that are going to feel these rippling effects in the world food economy, right? Uh, Egypt's a great example, but you know there's like tin lined up after. Um, and it just sort of, as the seasons roll along, like this is this is just going to continue to unfold in country after country. Uh, the second is um, really thinking at a shorter run scale. So in the past few years, um, you know what climate shocks have done to the world food system, and so you know across the Sahel. Um, you know, and, and even across some major producing regions, like a lower than optimal canola harvest, you know, in Canada, uh, which may seem very far afield from, from where we're talking about right now, but these, these, a couple of bad years in some important places have led to just world food stocks being lower than they've been in a few decades. So, so you have this long run trend kind of pushing you know, the country's kind of over the edge of being able to produce, you know, uh, an optimal fraction of their food domestically and, and being more reliant on imports. And then you have these higher frequency shocks that have really squeezed our reserves, um, you know, in a way that's kind of analogous to the energy system. And I think, you know, similarly, we also worry about what the feedbacks mean for climate policy when we think about food, right? Um, 
I'm I'm very worried, as I'm sure you are, Lisa. Uh, you know, in the long run, thinking about what sort of decisions governments make about food production, and if a whole bunch of uh, you know uh, high carbon habitat is now rolled into food production because everybody's worried about um, depending too much on the market. That's a disaster for climate, right? If this is this is just seen as the the rationale for mowing down the rainforest, it's a terrible outcome. Um, uh, for everyone. We have a, I'm going to, uh, the written question for you, Jen, which, which I'll ask for a moment in a moment, but, uh, for our zoom organizers after that, I'll, I'll call in Stephen Clary. Um, if, if we can unmute him next, uh, but, but Jen, we have a, we have a question from anonymous attendee, uh, didn't want to put their name. What are other countries doing or should they be doing to mitigate the impending food security crisis? Yeah, it's a great question. So uh, just another um, another reason to feel less optimistic right now is that even before Russia invaded Ukraine, right, the, the World Food Program, the UN, um, the, the sort of main aid organization globally, um, had its highest level of sort of anticipated need in, in um, you know, 15 or 20 years um, prior to the invasion. Uh, and those requisitions uh, aren't being met, right? Um, Steph and I have talked about this a lot, uh, that, uh, that, you know, the, the, the sort of ask is there. It's a big one already on the table prior to this, and it, it's not being met. So, um, you know, the first is just mobilizing support. Um, fastest is cash, but probably most urgent for some of these places is actually direct food um, shipments. And, and those have become kind of unpopular because they can be market distorting and they can sort of um, hamper development after a shock and recovery after a shock. But in this case, you know, we really need food moving around. And so uh, thinking about mobilizing both capital and food supplies is something that really needs to happen and it needs to happen quickly. I think the other thing is that Biden talked about sort of you know, making sure that there were no trade restrictions, um, or sort of making sure that there's a good trade environment for food. And I think that's a, um, a, a diplomatic nudge to um, many of the countries who've been known to sort of slap export bans down um, because they're nervous about nervous about domestic supplies and, and, and probably most pointedly um, uh, at India. So it'll be interesting to see what happens there. I admit, finally, you know, China, China's position has changed so much in the past um, decade or so, right? It went from being kind of a like weak net producer, net exporter of food to the world's biggest importer um, and has just been buying up food on the global market um, for months uh, and months prior to the invasion. So it, it, it does beg a little bit of the question of, what, <laughs> of what's going on and, and what's going to happen and, and really what, um, what China's stocks look like and um, what potential strategic role they play um, on either side of this. I think it's an it's a open question and I'm a little bit nervous to see how it plays out. Lisa, can I just uh, jump in and make one very small point here? Because it has to do with the nature of the humanitarian catastrophe at the moment. It's a sad irony that we've got these civil wars, which are really generating some of the most severe food demands. Uh, Yemen is often seen at the top of the list, but you might have seen the donors conference with respect to Afghanistan wasn't able to... Uh, to, to raise the money needed there, in part, again, ironically, because of central bank sanctions, which the United States has maintained against Afghanistan. You've got the civil wars around the Sahel. You've got northern Ethiopia. You've still got fragility in Syria and so on. Um, and, you know, all of this is putting additional burdens on the World Food Program on top of the climactic conditions in some of those places precisely, think Somalia, East Africa, the Sahel, which are also driving need. So it's really another one of these perfect storm situations like 2007, 2008. Yeah, and the UN estimated that the place, you know, in the places that are feeling an economic downturn, which is everywhere due to COVID, right? Uh, um, a climate shock or, or recent climate shocks and any sort of civil uh, violence, like over 90% of people in the places that are that are experiencing those three things simultaneously, aren't you know aren't able to access nutritious diet completely. So it's it's harrowing numbers. Sorry, Let, let's go to uh, 
uh, folks, uh, let's say, I think we have Stephen Carlson. I'll just remind folks if you're asking a question uh, in, the, in the panel, keep it to a question uh, succinct if you can. Thank you, Stephen. I think it's Stephen Clary is, yeah, there it is. Hey, thanks, David, Jen, Steph, good to see you all, and Vijay. Uh, David, uh, as my comment in the question was that the Germans, of course, have had a love-hate relationship with nuclear power forever. Uh, does the current crisis suggest any way of walking back that policy, as we're seeing in France, the UK, Bulgaria, Czech Republic, and now Poland? Uh, I mean, clearly others are embracing this as an approach to zero carbon. Yeah, I'm, I think a lot of folks have had a love-hate relationship, and some of it is concern, fear, dread. We can actually measure this in public opinion polls, dread of nuclear. It's certainly, that's a big part of the German story. You remember they went through Chernobyl, and then they went through the political uh, shocks after Fukushima, such that there was essentially unity almost, across almost all the political spectrum in Germany against nuclear power. There are a couple reactors that are still sl slated to be closed. I think next year, VJ mentioned, you know, maybe they'll be extended out. It's pretty hard when you're close to the uh, a year away from the end of a life uh, lifetime of a reactor to turn around and maybe run a little bit longer. But, but you have to plan for refueling and a bunch of other things. And I see no evidence that that kind of spade work is really being done. So I, I, th I think you will, some countries that have a lot of operational reactors will extend the lifetime. We're gonna see that here in the United States because it's one of the cheapest ways to continue having bulk low carbon power. The really big question is new build nuclear reactors. And I think there you see a lot of interesting new designs, but they're in the early stages and they're still pretty expensive. And, 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 and that just remains to, be developed. Let, let me just say one more thing about this, which is we have to remember the emerging economies for nuclear power as well, because almost all the growth in, in emissions is coming from the emerging economies. And there we have a huge stake in what's, gonna, what's happening here with the, with the crisis in Russia, because the dominant exporter of nuclear reactors and fissile material with it, the dominant export in the global market is Russia. Um, there's one Korean project being built in Abu Dhabi. There's a bunch of Russian projects all around the world. There's plausibly going to be a Chinese export industry that's kind of taking shape. But we have a big stake in the West in continuing to have some visibility and control over the flow of fissile material and, and reactor materials. And we've done a, frankly, pretty poor job of that because outside this Korean project in Abu Dhabi, we don't have a business model. And that's, that's economically viable. That's a huge, huge concern, I think. PJ, you wanted to add on? Yeah, just a, a quick point down the line, uh, David's um, final note about uh, business models. Um, you know, uh, uh, nuclear, I think, needs to be part of the solution for, uh, for deep decarbonization. I think it's almost necessary uh, uh, to some degree of penetration. I hope these newer technologies, like the small modular reactors, Rolls-Royce, uh, the company is working on them in the UK, Bill Gates and others have some uh, more futuristic concepts. They're going to take a decade or more to, to make it any meaningful dent. Um, the problem with nuclear as it stands, a traditional nuclear approach is, um, you know, it's the most expensive way to boil water. That's the joke in the energy industry. Um, uh, it is the only industry of its scale where far from learning by doing, like solar panels get cheaper the further you go along. There's a beautiful technology curve on how things get cheaper. This is an industry that's been forgetting by doing. New nuclear plants on the same design cost more than the old ones uh, because the way the industry has been organized and regulated and nimby to death, that um, far from learning, getting economies of scale, be doing cookie cutter plants that get cheaper and cheaper and more modular, uh, this industry is an utter business disaster and regulated disaster. So uh, I don't see hopes for a revival of the traditional industry. I hope the newer approach will prove nimble and successful. Um, let's stay with, with energy for another moment. Uh, we have a question from William Conisher. Uh, is it possible that renewables could be brought online in the next one to two years to cover significant portions of the shortfall from Russian oil and gas, given the same amount of capital investment that's being suggested for Europe and US fossil fuel companies? Uh, David, is that, you know, how, how quickly can, how quickly can renewables be the answer? I mean, the, the short answer is no. <laughs> um, there, there's already supply chain challenges in the new, in the in the 
renewables business. Um, wind projects require a lot of parts and gear and so on, especially the biggest ones that, that operate at scale, offshore wind, um, solar panels as well. We're seeing already news about shortages and price spikes in solar panels. This pressure to onshore supplies because of concerns about global supply chains is plausibly actually going to raise prices rather than lower prices. So the concerns there. I think the good news about renewables is they're taking off. And in some markets um, where there's been big support, sometimes overly generous, support like Spain or now in California, extraordinary support, extraordinary takeoff of renewables in California. But these are still isolated markets. And the global picture of renewables, solar and wind, at least the new renewables, are still only a few percent of, of market share. And that while they're rising, you have to remember scale here. And the, just the sheer volume of energy that comes uh, in take the European market from oil and gas is just massive. And uh, oil is, is, of course, important for transportation fuels principally. Gas is important for electricity. The renewable story is an electricity story um, uh, and has been kind of a bit of a horror story when it comes to biofuels, although maybe there's some technologies improving there. But the main renewable story has been electric power story. And, and it's hard to shake that volume of gas that quickly. Stephen, this is a question for you from Michael Wagrich. Is the Russian economy too big to avoid sanctions in the same way that Iran has via shadow corporations? What does the West anticipate Russian policymakers will do to avoid sanctions? Yeah, well, this this really is is something that has to be taken into account, you know, because when you when you institute sanctions, you can't imagine that the adversary is just going to simply sit there and allow them to operate. And it's clear that the Central bank is is thinking hard. The Russian central bank is thinking hard about how to offset the effects of these, and so you've seen a series of countermeasures. For example, capital controls have been instituted that have limited the ability of Russian citizens to take money out. Um, the Russian stock exchange has managed to rebound somewhat, but in part because. You, you can't sell, you know, foreign company, foreign holders can't sell. They can't get uh, assets out of Russia. And so there's gonna be a lot of, of quite nasty politics going forward. Uh, for example, potential nationalization of the assets that are being abandoned by firms, uh, partly because of the sanctions, partly just because of the aversion to being seen operating in Russia. And there's a possibility of Chinese foreign direct investment and in picking up assets and backstopping uh, Russia. So, you know, this is going to be a pretty leaky sanctions regime. And I think that China pretended to be even handed in the early days, though not very well. But it's just become increasingly clear over the last several weeks that they're going to double down. And the only way which they might be constrained is a topic we haven't talked about, which is that US export controls are actually quite interesting in the crisis. And the US is trying to uh, operate those export controls at a distance by threatening that they'll institute secondary sanctions against entities which are exporting anything to Russia that contains American technology. And so a looming bit in this whole story going forward is whether the US is gonna pull that trigger. I think that's something that's a big decision. So don't go anywhere. Follow up question from Carolyn Freund for, for you or, or perhaps Vijay. Thoughts on the ruble rebound if sanctions are severe and, and constraining? Yeah, well, look, you know, I think that markets tend to overshoot, you know, I'm not a guy who believes that they operate in a perfectly rational manner. So, you know, there was a lot of panic selling, people couldn't access their bank accounts, they couldn't take money out of the country, you had this huge spike. And then, you know, the capital controls were there, the restrictions on trading were there, and so on. And so the ruble has come back down. And also this whole issue, which Dave and Vijay may want to speak to, is this threat to demand payment in rubles. You saw that immediately on that announcement, there was a buoying of the foreign exchange market in the anticipation that you know, Europeans would essentially have to enter into those markets and purchase rubles in order to, to, uh, to, to pay for the oil that they were purchasing. 
Now, I'm sort of skeptical about this. I don't think this made much sense because Gazprom Bank is going to have to sell some of the foreign exchange it's paid, even when you've got an open system, into the ruble market. But, uh, but you know, there are lots of things that Russia can do. It's a relatively closed economy. It's got oil. It's got food. It's not going to be subject to the same vulnerabilities as Iran. I think it could stumble through this, frankly. And that raises the question of whether any of this will affect how Putin approaches the war itself, which is, remember, is one of the things we're interested in. Yeah. Just let the group know. I'm still taking questions from the Q&A. If, if you want to ask your own question, feel free to raise your hand. Uh, it does look like this is seeming to be a little easier and quicker, though. Um, this is uh, from an anonymous attendee and, and really, I think, goes out to the crowd. Who believes that the U.S. should be playing a more active role? And if so, what more should the U.S. be doing? Well, can I say, we're playing a very active role right now. It's uh, my colleague at Brookings Institution, Michael Hanlon, and I wrote this op-ed in the L.A. Times before the shooting war began, laying out all these things that we thought were pretty aggressive sanctions. And so, you know, they're not going to do this. They did it all in the first week. And, and we did SWIFT and yeah, on and on and on. My expectation is we're going to start chipping away at the embedded technology controls that stuff was talking about there. The Russians have been preparing for some of this for a while. After 2014, the sanctions and in the aftermath of Crimea, they developed some more you know, onshoring of Russian technology, which has helped for the onshore oil production. It's not helped them with other areas where they really rely very heavily on Western technology, uh, LNG exports, for example, which is kind of one of the ways of the future. Um, and so I, I think actually we're doing a huge amount. And my bigger concern is, is, is actually the erosion of public support. You kind of drag, you get into a stalemate and the Russians are there and it's only part of Ukraine and, um, and it all seems messy and we're busy worrying about other things. And then you start to lose political support. It becomes a political um, football here. Through the NBC poll last week, very interesting because it shows a lot of, a lot of support for the actions in uh, uh, American actions against, uh, against Russia, but no change, effectively no change statistically in support for Biden and support for the president. So I think actually, this is going to be very, very problematic uh, for, for us to hold our political support together. Other folks, yeah. chime in. Yeah, I think there's a real opportunity for U.S. leadership in addressing the food security crisis. Mm -hmm. um, you know, both through kind of mobilizing um, both you know financial and direct food contributions, and and being really out there in public about doing that. Uh, but also a real political opportunity to put U.S. farmers uh, at the center of this as really like, um, you know, kind of key players in the world food economy, right? Uh, the, the trade war with China was really terrible for American farmers. Um, and this is an opportunity to, to, uh, to showcase like U.S. production in a season that's going to be really, really important. Um, and I think to, to that, that would be one key to potentially building an interesting coalition or, you know, a, a new type of coalition that might help um, in the longer run. I don't mean to be simplistic in asking it this way, but I mean, are you talking about the U.S. sort of replacing, uh, you know, wheat and other, and other uh, food sources the, the same way energy companies are being asked to 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 produce more exactly hmm. um lisa if i could add a thought to that in terms please. of what more the u.s could do um i think you know at, uh, there are strong impulses towards nativism economic nationalism uh, and you know the language of energy independence was on the rise including in the u.s before this crisis um and i think that uh i would argue it's a controversial point but i would argue that uh, real energy security lies with interdependence, not with independence. Um, and often it leads to you know, inefficient and uh, sometimes dirty or, or cronyistic investments uh, if you try to get, do everything at home. 
Uh, but says having networks of reliable suppliers, the U.S. can take the lead in this, as the U.S. is trying to do with natural gas and LNG, showing that you can have uh, connectedness that actually enhances your reliability, have a diversity of supplies, encourage our allies also to have things like buffer stocks, which Europe doesn't really have in natural gas, for example, there's proposals for that, uh, like we do in oil. You know, there are things that you can do that might cost a little bit of money, that might be an insurance policy, but that could keep uh, the parts of the world that are um, uh, at the moment vulnerable to bad actors like Putin um, uh, connected and more resilient in future, rather than resorting to sticking our heads in the sand. Yeah, and I know you want to go on another question, but I just agree 100%. And question. that's why Vijay and I are not running for, for elected <laughs> office. Um, but I that and our support for carbon taxes, David. Yeah, that, though, that kind of rules well, I'm, I'm a little more lukewarm on that. Than, but but um, be that as it may, I think there's a that one of the dangers lurking in here is the threat industry. So, so there's a whole apparatus, national security apparatus, that sees threats everywhere. And the threat industry has spun up around threats, including supply chain threats. And their response has been onshoring and autarky, not what Vijay said, which is exactly the right answer, which is in these areas, security comes from diversity and diversity alone. And, uh, and we are not articulating that that is a strategy. We're instead allowing the threat industry to dominate this. And I think that's a concern for the country. Hmm. Um. We have about five minutes more of questions. I'm going to go through some of these uh, from from Payam Shasa, Shasa Vandi. Uh, to help with the current energy crisis, do you think Europe would expedite the JCPA talk with Iran? Uh, I don't know if David or or Stephen. Probably Steph. I, I think I think the Europeans are not the problem, but I don't know, Steph. Are you want to talk about it? Or VJ, are you following JCPA? Well, look, if we can talk to Maduro, there's no reason we can't talk to the Iranians. I mean, there are a complex set of issues that have to do with Iran, Russian relations there that maybe David can talk to, but we shouldn't have gotten out of the JCPOA to begin with, in my humble opinion. So getting back into it would be the right thing to do, regardless of whether it has an effect on the energy picture. Yeah, and there's going to be a lot of energy suppliers who are in effect beneficiaries from this. You know, you've seen it all come on from Libya, the Iranian, we've expedited the Iranian arrangements. The politics here about rejoining are not trivial. Venezuela is a train wreck. So we'll, I don't think that all the discussions with Venezuela are going to produce a lot of oil. But but uh, um, I don't know, Vijay, what you're seeing in the markets, but but I think we're hunting for barrels, as they say. <laughs> exactly. That's right. I mean, you know, David, you talked about winners. Uh, you know, it, it's a tragic irony, but Russia itself is one of the winners uh, from the chaos that it itself has caused and the sanctions that resulted from it. Just on one estimate, um, uh, Gazprom earned over $20 billion in the first two months of this year, about as much as it earned in the entire year 2020, just as a comparison point. And so uh, Putin is profiting, sadly, from the current situation. Richard Leaves asks, you know, it says the beginning of COVID-19 resulted in empty supermarket shelves nationwide. What's the possibility that this might happen with the food shortages being discussed here? Jen, what what? does the, the moving food crisis mean for us here in the United States? Uh, you know, the, the, the onset of the pandemic, we're all sort of in pandemic um, marathon mode now, but when we were in pandemic sprint, right, that was sort of a different set of problems, right? This was like literally industries and factories being shuttered and people, you know, being ordered to stay at home. and, and and this is this is and also panic buying, right? And so this so two factors kind of contributing to that. I don't see that happening right now. Um, but you know, high prices hurt poor people everywhere, right? Who who depend on um, who use a large portion of their income for food, and and that's no different uh, in the U.S. Um, and so depending on how long this this high price regime sort of rolls along, it's gonna have really hard impacts on um, poor families in the US. So, you know, thinking about things the Biden administration might do, um, we saw, for example, during COVID that free meals um, for all kids at school, um, you know, breakfast, lunch, mm -hmm. dinner, right? Going home to families has been an incredibly important, um, you know, social safe piece of the social safety net over the pandemic. And you could imagine if this high price environment rolls along, that would be a real natural thing to consider um, extending. 
in the last two minutes we have, I'm hoping that each of you can take 30 seconds uh, to, to just kind of tell us in your respective areas, energy, food, sanctions, what you're looking at next, what, what you're paying attention to, what we should be looking for. David, can we start with you? Sure. I'm looking at two things. I'm looking at do, does, does the Western regime hold together on the sanctions? It's extraordinary what they've achieved. Fissures are inevitable. That's one. And the second thing I'm looking at is can we walk and chew gum at the same time? Can we do what BJ talked about in, in the opening of this, which is really invest in the long term around carbon uh, and climate while also dealing with the immediate questions. And a, a litmus test for that is going to be the capital budgets for these oil companies, but then also whether governments put into place the policies we need. Yeah. I'm looking at China, you know, in, in terms of where the, the entire picture is going and whether the world economy is going to start to seriously bifurcate in a way which we're just not talking about, where China and Russia cleave. We've got extensive interdependence, but less with China and more with allies. And that kind of division, you know, where you've got two parallel universes that are, at least at the margin, are in fact decoupling. Jen? Yeah, I'm, um, I'm looking at the weather. I'm really hoping for very optimal production conditions for the next few seasons, um, both for those you know, directly dependent on it and for replenishing our really depleted global stocks. I'm also really interested to see if there's any kind of international institutional innovation in thinking about um, rebuilding um, some of our uh, buffer capacity in the world food economy, you know, maintaining actual food stocks, for example, again, in the US. Mm. BJ, close this out. What is your, what is your next cover story? So I, I'm looking at the tension between this drill baby drill moment that we're in and um, that hope and aspiration there had been for, for taking on climate change with greater ambition. Um, if, it, if I hope it doesn't lead to that climate fatalism that was skewered in a wonderful way by your newspaper recently in an article that talked about, okay, doomer, people of a certain generation being overly negative about our prospects to deal with the climate challenge. I'm hopeful that uh, we won't end up there, but instead we'll have that somewhat more optimistic and innovative approach of the younger generation carry the day. Perfect. I just, I really want to thank all of you for a wonderful discussion. I want to thank our audience for terrific questions. I'm going to turn this back over to, to David to close us out. And, and uh, I think this, you guys were great. Thank you. Well, let me just my last bit of business tonight, in addition to thanking the panelists, is to thank you, Lisa Friedman, for your terrific moderation and for all the discussions. Really appreciate it very much. I wish everyone uh, a lovely evening and I look forward to more of these webinars as we try and uh, grapple with the new world that we're in. So thank you all very much. Thanks all.